Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to this episode of the podcast. I am Ducky. I am the host of Wool in the Forest here on YouTube. And if you are finding this podcast and my channel for the first time, thank you so much for discovering me. I hope you will like this episode. I hope you will uh, subscribe and stick around and look at some of my older work. And yeah, just thank you for, for being here with me. And if you are a returning viewer, a returning friend, thank you so much for coming back. Um, and I hope you've all been well since the last episode. So just a little bit about me. I am a textile artist. I'm a working artist. Um, and that's actually where I am podcasting to you out of my little textile studio here, where I work as a indigo um, textile artist working with indigo dye and natural handwoven fabrics and natural fibers and ancestral techniques such as batik from my uh, homeland of Sri Lanka. I am Sri Lankan. I was born and raised in Sri Lanka and that's very much where I call home. But right now I'm coming to you from the far flung western tip of the Pacific Northwest of the United States on the Olympic Peninsula, <clears throat> which is where I live in a little one room cottage in the forest surrounded by uh, the Pacific, uh, rather the Olympic National Forest in the Olympic Peninsula. I live here with my husband and our four children. So we are a family of six living in a very small one room cottage in the woods. And we very much are grateful for and love this life. So that's a little bit about me and all the digital online spaces <laughs> that you will find me in our um, YouTube, of course, as Wool in the Forest. My website and my blog is on woolintheforest.com. I am on Instagram as at Wool in the Forest. And what else? And of course, I am on Patreon uh, as patreon.com slash wool and the forest. And talking about Patreon, thank you, thank you, all my dear patrons and subscribers who are uh, the supporters of this channel. It is your support and it is um, your encouragement that helps me to keep bringing podcast episodes out and keeps this channel afloat. As a busy, busy mother of four children, uh, two homeschool kids and, you know, all the stuff that comes with it. I'm so grateful for your support so that I can keep making videos for this channel. So thank you, patrons. So that's all the um, sort of admin, podmin uh, gotten rid of at the outset of the podcast. Uh, my friend, my dear friend, Sandra from the Cherry Heart podcast, she always calls it podmin. And I think that's, <laughs> that's a very cute and appropriate word to discuss all these things that we need to say and um, make sure people you know, receive the correct information before we get into the meat of the podcast. So in terms of the meat of the podcast, um, what do I have in store for you today? Well, as usual, we're going to start off by talking about what I'm wearing. Then I have two works in progress to show you. Unfortunately, I have zero completed works because well, simply because I have been beset by a pretty serious health issue that has really brought so much in my life to an absolute standstill. And it's one of the reasons why I have taken so long since the last episode to, uh, to record is simply because my health has just been suffering a lot. And I have been suffering, just physically suffering. Um, and, you know, as I said, everything has just come to a bit of a standstill. And stay till the end of the podcast and I'll give you a little update on what's been going on. And to be honest, I'm still very much in the throes of the health issue that has gripped me. <laughs> but this morning I was feeling just well enough. And it's a bit like that. It's, you know, up and down, quite, quite a lot of crests and troughs and crests and troughs. So um, this morning I was riding a crest and I thought, you know, uh, I'm going to 
I'm going to use it to its maximum <laughs> potential and decided that a podcast recording was something that was within my reach today. So stay till the end and I'll update you all on what's been happening with my health. Um, so two works in progress, no uh, completed works. Then we'll move on uh, to talking a little bit about embroidery on wool. This is uh, something that I thought, you know, I had a few ideas, a few thoughts on, I wanted to get your input on. And um, the fourth part of the podcast is actually uh, leading on from one of my works in progress. We're going to talk about my new, I would say my new favorite project for this year in terms of my knitting is my Gryffindor house wardrobe. Oh yes. <laughs> you know, if you watch the last episode of the podcast that I was knitting those Gryffindor socks, well, they are still in progress, but they're nearing completion. And as their completion drew nearer, all these visions and plans for more Gryffindor things <laughs> started to arrive unbidden. Well, of course not unbidden, but still, I am so excited to share the details of my planning uh, a full-on Gryffindor house wardrobe for myself for this year. And the next seg segment is I would like to talk a little bit about my handspun stash and do a bit of handspun show and tell. Then I'll speak a little bit about my recent spinning work. I have been getting back into my spinning and it's been giving me so much joy. And it's one of those things that I've had, you know, just enough energy for. But then when my health really tanked, I had, I had to take a bit of a step back. So recent spins, then I'll speak a little bit about uh, a lot of sewing and pattern making and designing that I've been doing. Just a tiny bit of that. Um, as a working artist, I'm preparing my first collection after having been pregnant and given birth to my last baby, who is now nearing his second birthday, but he's about four months away from that. And this year I'm releasing for the first time after a long maternal uh, maternity break, as it were, uh, my uh, first collection, uh, an autumn winter collection towards the end of this year. So I've been uh, getting into planning for that and pattern designing for that and pattern making and all that. And of course, that also means a lot of uh, prototype sewing. So I've been doing a little bit of sewing and I can show you a tiny bit of that at the end of the episode. So um, here we go. Let's get right into the, the meat of the episode. Now, um, before we start talking about my knitting, I do have one tiny bit of podmin <laughs> left to do uh, that has nothing to do uh, with details or information, but rather to do with the giveaway that I ran in December 2023. I ran a holiday giveaway and I simply hadn't had time to uh, choose the winner. And for the giveaway, I was giving away this lovely skein of Hellesvag Solia, beautiful Norwegian uh, wool from a very, very well-known and esteemed Norwegian woolen mill. And one of my handmade, hand-dyed um, project pouches that I had made a while back out of all indigo-dyed, hand-woven fabrics. Um, so I was giving this as a pair and I have chosen the winner and you will see the name appear <laughs> probably around here right about now. And I hope you're wa watching this episode. And if you are, congratulations. Please get in touch with me in a more private way. I think the safest and most private would be a direct message on Instagram. Um, so that uh, I can get your address and post this off to you as soon as possible. So there's our last bit of Podmin done. So first, let's talk a little bit about what I'm wearing. Very little to say because the last episode of the podcast was all about this wonderful Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Zimmerman chain mail jumper, this chain mail uh, ski jumper that I have knitted in, uh, in unspun wool from Nuttedin and Einband Icelandic lace weight. So the last episode of the podcast was a full-on sort of um, ode 
to not just to Elizabeth Zimmerman, who I adore, 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 uh, but also to uh, the knitting of this jumper, which was very much a labor of love. And it was sort of a breaking of the mold for, uh, for me in terms of exploring new techniques and exploring knitting things that I was kind of afraid to do before. And uh, I, anyway, if you want to know more about it, look at the previous episode and you will see all about it. I am wearing this probably for the last time. <laughs> it is becoming far too warm to wear anything as um, warm as a double layered, unspun and Icelandic uh, mixed jumper anymore. It's, uh, you know, this, this looks deceptively light and it is like when you pick it up the fabric is very light but the unspun and the Icelandic together and the all over color work oh there is nothing light about uh, the warmth of this jumper it is incredibly incredibly warm even there have been days that I have gone out in it um, you know in the earlier part of spring where I felt like oh I you know after a couple of hours I need to take it off because it's simply too warm. So this will be the last time you see it for a long time. So that is what I am wearing. Now let's carry on straight away to the works in progress, um, as I don't have any completed projects to show you, but I do have projects to show you that have been giving me so much joy. Let me grab this wonderful basket. And you would have seen this in the intro to this episode. I was knitting away um, in the woods before it became so dreary and wet because we have had a few days of absolutely glorious weather which suddenly just stopped yesterday. It just went uh, into absolute, you know, <laughs> Typical Pacific Northwestern, of course, it looks like, feels like a return to winter, but a slightly, slightly milder return to winter. But everywhere we look, there's just nothing but signs of spring. Spring is just, you can smell it, the earth is alive, the alder catkins are all hanging ripe and heavy from all the alders around uh, the house and on our property. Um, there are already blossoms, the also berry blossoms always the first to come and they're already shedding and falling, which means berries, our first berries will be here soon. And our native cherries are about to start blossoming. Our maples, the great western maples, which are, there are many surrounding uh, the cottage and on our property itself, there are so, so many great western maples, enormous ones. And their buds, which have been quite tight for the last three, four weeks are now, you know, cracking open and you can see the maple blossoms are going to fall out in those cascades. Um, those large, luscious catkins <laughs> will be hanging from them, I would say, in the next week or two at the most. And come the middle of April, uh, our family, my family and I, we have a a yearly spring ritual, which is we gather the freshest looking ones as soon as they come out of the pods, these maple blossoms, and I make maple blossom fritters, uh, deep fried maple blossom fritters, which we eat with either some sour cream or some ice cream if it's a nice warm day, um, with some powdered sugar on top. Yeah, it's one of our favorite things. And I'm sure if I'm, I will be podcasting at that time and I can show you um, a few bits and bobs of how I make them. Um, so I'm looking, there's so much to look forward to at the moment. The world is alive. Life is just coursing through everything. And uh, yeah, it's, I, and I have this sensation that it's going to be a particularly beautiful and abundant spring. Um, just, just looking at the sort of prolific way in which everything seems to be coming up. It's, uh, there is, I feel this sensation, the earth it smell, itself smells richer. So anyway, that's, that's, that's what's happening. I can't get away from it, you know. I am so attached to this beautiful um, 
forest that we live in. And when I say it, we live in the forest, I quite literally mean the the trees come right up to the cottage. I mean, right up to it. And there's very little uh, cleared land around uh, the cottage itself. So we live right in the thick of it. And it's very, very untamed uh, forest that has never been um, shorn, never been tamed, never been cut down. Uh, never been cultivated uh, in any kind of way. So it's a very wild, very wild rural landscape. Um, uh, not at all sort of the pastoral landscape of woodland f further away with fields and things. No, we have none of that. It's just mountain and ocean and just forest. <laughs> so um, how did I get to this point? Yes, it's because of the weather, of course, because one must talk about the weather, especially when times of transition. Well, how Every day is full of fresh delight, so why would you not talk about the weather, <laughs> I feel? Anyway, this beauty, talking of spring and things blossoming, this blossoming jumper, this beautiful thing is growing. I'm sorry for my sniffles, by the way. It's all seasonal stuff. Um, it's growing under my arms, in my hands, rather. And I'm now working away on one of the sleeves. The first of the sleeves is growing. So I spoke about this in the previous episode. At that point, I, was, I had just gotten past the yoke and this is the Floresta uh, colorwork jumper from Elena Solier and um, the designer. Her name is Elena Solier. And of course, as usual, all the details of everything I talk about will either be on the screen as I speak about it or it will be on the show notes in the description box below. So um, Elena Solier's beautiful jumper. I had just gotten past the yoke. And since then, I have completed the ribbing on the bottom. And it is made with this beautiful split hem. I hope you can see how the back hem, this might be better. Yeah, there's the better view of it. So the front hem is shorter than the back hem by quite a bit. And I actually lengthened the back hem even more than Elena had suggested in her pattern because I love a very nice long back on my split hems. And really the split hem was a delight to knit and I can tell how beautifully it's going to wear. It's going to be very flattering, especially for a cropped jumper. I think it's even more important to have um, the back behaving differently from the front in anything cropped. For example, on this jumper, I had to add quite a few um, uh, short rows so as to prevent, you know, the front of my neck from constantly going into my neck and from from that natural foreshortening that happens because of the shape of our, of our body. And I wish now that I had done the same to the hem at the, at the bottom because uh, I find that, especially because it's cropped, it's more noticeable that because of the curves in the front of our body versus the, you know, uh, the con concave curves of the back um, and the way fabric goes over those different curves in the body, um, the back of a, of a crop jumper will often stick out if it is not taken down quite a few inches below the front hem. So that impact is a lot more exaggerated in a crop, crop jumper like this. So Elena, was, uh, with all her cleverness, has designed um, the perfect hem for a jumper which is cropped like this. So that was lovely to make. Um, it did, the ribbing did take me quite a while because it's knit on very teeny tiny needles, but the effect is very pretty. Um, and you know, it's spring. So having this on my needles has felt so appropriate, so beautiful. And I won't lie that once I got away from the yoke, I was, <laughs> I was quite happy. Oh, it's it's been one of the most difficult bits of color work that I have knitted, uh, stranded work, because not just because it's a very organic uh, pattern, very organic, uh, compared 
to uh, the more uh, symmetrical uh, ge sort of geometric grid kind of patterns of Lopa Pesa, traditional Icelandic color work, which is what I've been mostly doing. This is a very different kind of patterning. So just reading the graph is a different experience. Keeping up with the repeats is a different experience. Things change a lot more unpredictably. The, the spaces within a round and the spaces, you know, from round to round and then decree, um, increasing in pattern and, you know, making sure you're reading that right. It was all, you know, quite, quite a lot for me. And to get, combining that with holding four different balls of yarn together the whole time because this jumper, I'm knitting it out of a... Um, um, so the the yoke is knit out of a, two strands of plotulopi, white plotulopi, and the body or the and the background in the yoke part, the background color is knit out of a one strand of nutidin uh, and one strand of Icelandic uh, einband. So. It's quite. A, it was quite a lot to juggle, and at the same time, be focused on the ever-changing miasma <laughs> of this gorgeous yoke. But what a reward! I mean, it's so pretty. It's so so pretty. My knitting um, leaves much to be desired. Of course, I hope I did some form of justice to this gorgeous pattern that Elena has um, has knitted. Um, I hope I didn't botch it too much. <laughs> with my inexperienced knitting. But I think with blocking and because it is unspun and because it is Icelandic and Nutidin, it is so forgiving. And I think all my terrible mistakes will probably get fudged right away or I could aggressively fudge it away. Um, so this, this is, I am so looking forward to it. In fact, it is so stunning that even my husband keeps commenting on it every time I take it out of my basket and I'm knitting it on it in the evenings and the night he always says wow that is so striking I can't wait to see you wearing it so that to me is like thumbs up in terms of the the uniqueness of the design like e even he has noticed it and he's like that just looks like so spectacular and I think it's going to look as spectacular as I want it to to be when it's blocked and um on my body so you know sometimes some knits really just need to be worn for it to fully come alive blocked and worn so what a gorgeous project to take me into spring um full of flowers and it's it's just what more can I say it's a lot it's been giving me a lot of joy now I want to talk more about Elena and the work she, I, every every episode when I show you this jumper I want to talk more about her because she is an incredible uh, designer, but not just a designer, an incredible wool producer, the kind of person whose work I really love to support. And I think the kind of wool worker who should be supported more and more um, if you truly love knitting and working with this incredible, beautiful gift of nature that is wool, a pure, untouched, unprocessed, gorgeous, gorgeous wool you know so um I keep saying you know a lot by the way I noticed when I was editing the last podcast and I'm going to be very very aware of it this time and try to reduce those you knows so uh, I will speak about Elena in the episode where I hope to wear this and to show it as a completed project um, that's where I really uh, want to get into and introduce you a little bit more to her work. But in the meantime, you can always go and find her work on her website. And I have listed the website, of course, in the description box as well. So Elena Solius Floresta giving me continuous joy in the knitting and joy in the dreaming of what it's going to look like when it comes off my needles and onto me. So let me here have a quick look at both my phone and <laughs> my notes because I have a little baby, as I said, who is in the house with his papa, my little baby boy. And there's a toddler in the house as well. And my two older ones, uh, when my two older are homeschooled and today, of course, is a, is a weekend. And um, wait a minute. 
No, it's not a weekend. <laughs> but they're they're off. Um, they're off lessons for today, which is why I'm out here podcasting, and that helps my uh, my husband to kind of look after the baby because the older my older girls who are uh, ten and under um, are very good at. Um, uh, looking after their younger sister, my toddler, who was here as a guest <laughs> in our last podcast. But she very much uh, wanted to play with her sisters today because they are very much, you know, like that now. Uh, quite a little uh, trio of troublemakers. So I need to look at my phone quite a bit to make sure my little nursling is not suddenly wanting um, mama and uh, need to run back inside the cottage or bring him out here. So you might see him. I'm not entirely sure. I'm hoping to get through this before he calls on me. So on my notes for the next one is my second work in progress. My second works in progress. So what I have to show you here are my Gryffindor socks. Now, I think in the last episode I had finished I had finished this one, this particular sock, and I was had just started knitting on the second one. I'm just arranging it here. I have not blocked either of them yet. Oh. Um, and I have since then finished the second pair. So if you notice that in terms of color, they're actually the inverse of each other. Um, the stripes on this are the opposite of the stripes on this. The colors have been, you know, uh, mixed up uh, in order to make sure that I had enough wool to knit these up, uh, knit these up in. And um, I, I asked my viewers last, in the last episode, if you would like the recipe for this sock, because it's really a simple uh, top-down construction, cuff-down rather, cuff-down construction uh, with ribbing and a very traditional um, heel flap gusset. Let me try and show you some of that. Heel flap and gusset construction, which I'm absolutely in love with and has become my go-to way recently after completing two pairs for myself and my husband of my hand spun socks. Um, I have decided that this is the only way I want to knit socks because they fit so well. Cuff down, heel flap, gusset, and for myself, a rounded barn toe, which is how I have finished it. So if you like, and many of you wrote back on the comments of that episode and said, yes, please share your sock recipes. So when this is a completed project, which I believe will be the following episode, the next episode, I will be releasing the recipe for this as well, for these Gryffindor house socks. And I really love them. I really love them. And I'm glad that it is still cold enough in terms of socks that I'll be able to wear these a few times before they retire and hide away in my sock box for the next winter. However, the reason these are being classed as works in progress and not completed projects is because of this here. Here you can see that I have just started doing a little patch of embroidery. Now I bring this closer so you can have a look and see if you can guess what am I embroidering on these Gryffindor socks? Don't need a lot of <laughs> a lot of wittiness to guess that. That's a Gryffindor lion, of course. I decided that once these were done, I was actually knitting away on this one, uh, this sock, when I realized that I wanted to show them off a bit more as Gryffindor socks. And I realized the perfect way to do that would be to do some embroidery. So I went online and I looked and looked and looked for sort of patches and images of lions and things like that, like what something that would be easy enough for me to embroider without making it look too messy, uh, embroidering with wool and on a small, you know, in a small area. And I found a little design that I liked and I copied it on to this piece of wash away stabilizer. And I have um, 
I have stitched the stabilizer on to the sock uh, in order to kind of make it a little bit more stable as it were and actually I have used two pieces so there's a one square of wash away stabilizer on the outside of the sock with the design on it and there's another square on the inside of the sock and the reason for this is that this is a sock and I don't actually have a small enough embroidery hoop that can fit inside without distorting the stitches and without overstretching my sock. Um, a small enough embroidery hoop that can go inside and, you know, lock this fabric in place and make it stable so as to reduce puckering, which is usually the reason you would use an embroidery hoop and or stabilizing or backing fabric um, is to stop your stitches from puckering when, you know, when the project is done. And especially in a situation like this where you're uh, using wool and on a small area, you're more likely to pucker. But I don't have a hoop that's small enough, nor was I going to buy one tiny hoop for just this project. Uh, more on that later but so the, I decided I need to make the background fabric as stable as I could so using two pieces of wash away stabilizer made sense so um, I'll try to cut in you know this footage with a little bit of separate footage where I show you how I do this um, and I use you know um, using two layers of uh, stabilizer and running stitches to hold that in space uh, hold that in place rather, and then doing, uh, starting on the embroidery. So right now where I am is doing some outlining of the lion, and then I'm going to fill that outline in probably with straight stitches or some form of, um, you know, a broken satin stitch, something like that to quickly fill the lion in. And then whoop, the whole thing will go into the water and the wash away stabilizer will melt away and hopefully <laughs> leave behind a beautiful white uh, embroidered lion on my Gryffindor socks. So I am so excited. So you can see my excitement, I think, about these. And um, this, actually, I wanted to use this talking about these socks uh, to talk about it embroidering on wool in general. So I wanted to use this as a sort of a, a little path to get into that. The reason that I have used wash away stabilizer here uh, is because this is a sock. Now I know that embroidering on wool has recently become a very, very popular thing. I've seen it crop up everywhere uh, on Instagram. I'm constantly seeing reels going by with people, you know, embroidering these beautiful designs, um, embroidering on knits rather, on hand knits, and then putting it in the water and you see the stabilizer just melting away, leaving behind a beautiful floral landscape. <laughs> it's like everywhere at the moment, whereas I, I'm fairly certain even two, three years ago, it was a very rare thing to find people embroidering their own hand knits. Um, but I have always been a great proponent of embroidering your knits. And for two reasons. I think you should find any opportunity to embellish uh, that which you have already made with your hands. Um, I think it can only bring more life as the years go by, as, as you keep adding to these beautiful things that you made for yourself. But also, it's a wonderful way of both covering up mistakes um, and repairing holes and you know, issues that come up in your knitting. So it's for both embellishment and repair. Uh, I have always used embroidery on my knits to uh, to cover up things, <laughs> to fix things, and to just, you know, perpetually embellish something I made years ago. So um, a great lover of embroidering on knits. Now, there's a Coming back to why I used uh, stabilizer. Now, wash away stabilizers have become very popular, I think, with people for embroidering on knits. Whereas when I first started, I didn't even have wash away stabilizers. And I want to show you the kind of things I did. Sorry, that was very loud. To stabilize my background fabric in order to do some embroidery on it. Now, this is something I showed on my Instagram a couple of years ago. 
This is a beautiful loom knit kimono style cardigan. This is one of my oldest and closest knitting knitted friends. This was loom knit in Korea and I purchased it from one of these lovely uh, boutiques, these tiny little ateliers that you find all over Korea. But this was when I was living in Seoul uh, in South Korea. And it's been hand loom knit and pieced together by hand. And I had worn it and worn it and worn it for so many years. And it, it is one of my most constant companions. So it had developed quite a few holes along the front here from shawl pins and things like that going into it. And um, I wanted to both fix it up and to give it new life. And a couple of years ago, I decided to cover it in these beautiful embroidered, um, I mean, I think they look a bit like sunflowers. Really, I wasn't going for sunflowers, but that's what they looked like. And I want to show you the way in which I did this particular wool uh, or embroidery on knits. So if you can see, and I hope the camera catches it, what I did for these was that I used pieces of cut out pieces, uh, little circles of felt. So I'm not sure if you can see that sitting under the stitches there, but those are pieces, little round pieces of felt, wool felt, that I used to both cover up the hole and also as a background or as a stabilizing background for my stitches so that they wouldn't pucker. Now that is a really, really good way if you want to avoid using um, wash away stabilizers and to use something you already have. This is the, the way in which I added embroidery to my knits for a long, long time. And it's it's wonderful because you can use a piece of felt from either, you know, something that no longer fits or a piece of felt that you're using for some other craft purposes or scrap pieces of felt that you have. And as long as they're thin enough and they match um, either thinner than the the background, the knitted background of the fabric that you're going to be embroidering on, or the same weight as the fabric uh, that you're going to be, the same thickness rather of the knitted fabric that you will be embroidering on. As long as they match in that way, the felt makes a beautiful, seamless, stabilizing background. So if you have holes, you just, what I did with these is that I put the stabilizer, the felt piece on the back, ran some running stitches around to hold it in place, and then I turned it around and embroidered on the front. Now, this too I embroidered without a hoop. The felt gave me enough stability that I was able to just, you know, hold the fabric in my hand and embroider it that way. So it's a wonderful way to fix holes in your knitting um, and also just to add pops of color and embellishment to your knits if you if you like to do so with embroidery. And there's, you know, wash away stabilizers um, are not something that I have used till very recently. And the only reason that I used it here in the sock is because it's a sock and I did not want anything adding bulk to this area so as to create that sort of uncomfortable sensation when you put it on on your feet. Because a sock is something that lives so close and snug and tight on your skin. I didn't want the sensation of something different, some added thing that was constantly, you know, you, you know, sometimes you get that sensation of something, uh, even if it's not harsh, like a piece of wool would be very soft, but you feel the difference between the sock and the piece of wool on your skin. And that in itself can be quite irritating. So I didn't want that, um, which is the reason here I thought it was appropriate to use wash away stabilizer. And I had a roll of wash away stabilizer that I had purchased already in my studio uh, for some other purpose. So I thought this was a good reason to use it. But if you would rather stay away from it, there are ways to do so, is what I wanted to say. So my Gryffindor socks, a little bit on of a little bit on wool embroidery on knits. And yeah, and I think that's that closes this segment of the podcast. Tell me uh, in the comments if you also enjoy embroidering your knits 
or embroidering on wool, even if it's uh, whether it's hand knits or store-bought knits, whether you like to bring life and color to your knitwear with embroidery and whether you enjoy it and whether you yourself have some nice tips and tricks and techniques uh, on how to stabilize fabric and how you get about your embroidery on knits. So that is that part of the podcast. Let me have a quick look at the time. Just there we go. Okay, we are still doing very well for time. So this next segment of the podcast, I want to speak to you a little bit about my plans for a Gryffindor house wardrobe. So the Gryffindor socks have really opened the floodgates and I have been sketching, planning, designing, looking at um, my knitwear books, a few, very few amount of knitwear books that I have on my shelf and coming up with ideas for a full wardrobe. So what I mean by wardrobe is it, if I was going to Hogwarts, which I always wish I was, <laughs> if I was going to Hogwarts, what would I take in my uh, little trunk on the Hogwarts Express in terms of knitwear that would also reflect the house that I know that I would most certainly be in? Definitely Gryffindor. It doesn't matter which test I take. You know, the online you can find so many different house tests, sort of like sorting tests, you know, the digital sorting hats, which put you in the house you would have been in if you had gone to Hogwarts as a wizard or a witch. Um, and it doesn't matter which test I've done from which website, I always end up in Gryffindor. <laughs> I am definitely a lifelong Gryffindor. So I have come up with a very simple wardrobe of, of course, my pair of socks, which I already have, a scarf, a pair of mittens, and a Gryffindor jumper. And I think that will set me, uh, set me in good stead for a year of studies as a witch <laughs> in the finest school of witchcraft and wizardry. So for my socks, I'm already taken care of. And I have a feeling that my mittens might be a sort of version of the socks, but I'll hold out on that because there, there's a there's a mitten that I'm about to show you that might also be a fine contender for my wardrobe, for my Gryffindor wardrobe. But let's start with the jumper. So I have here a book that I got for um, Christmas, I think it was like three years ago from my husband, who is also an enormous Wizarding World uh, Harry Potter fiend. <laughs> we are huge. Uh, fans of the entire, the books, the movies, the whole thing. So he got me um, this Wizarding World publication of Knitting Magic. Um, and it says that it's the official Harry Potter knitting pattern book from Tannis Gray. Tannis Gray is the author. It's a wonderful, fun publication. And, you know, my ki my girls and I, we constantly go through this book all the time. I always find it sitting around on a table or on the coffee table or on a chair because somebody has rifled through it <laughs> because it's full of fun little tidbits from the books and the movies, but also beautiful patterns. So this is this has been one of my main resources when planning my Gryffindor wardrobe. And for my jumper, I think this is going to be my inspiration. Now let's see if you can see that properly. Oh, there it is. That's better. So that is the Mrs. Weasley jumper. Just, uh, it's based on the Mrs. Weasley jumpers that you see constantly throughout the movies. Um, of all the jumpers, darling Mrs. Weasley, knits for her entire family and then also for Harry once Harry joins the family as a surrogate son as it were she sends everyone one of these jumpers for Christmas this is their Christmas jumper so if you know the story you know this know this well it's actually a picture here of Mrs Weasley and a sketch from the design crew when they were working on the knitwear um, that's from the first movie, the picture of Harry and Ron wearing their Weasley jumpers during Christmas. So I think my, definitely my um, inspiration for my Gryffindor jumper is going to be based on this. But instead of having a big old letter, D for ducky, 
I decided that I would, I can turn that into a lion so that it reflects the golden dragon of Gryffindor. And this, in this uh, pattern, this pattern is, uh, uh, it's knit in pieces, so which I really love. I love piece knitting. So uh, the back, the front, the back, and the two sleeves, they're knitted uh, flat in pieces and seamed up together, which is wonderful. It's one of my favorite ways to knit a garment, especially a jumper this large. So I'm going to enjoy just the construction part of it because I haven't knitted, I think I haven't knitted an in pieces jumper in a very long time. So I'm looking forward to that. And then the, the letter in this case, an R, uh, is done in duplicate stitch. So the whole thing is done up in duplicate stitch. So I think that's a perfect way for me to uh, to add, instead of a letter, add a lion, the outline of a golden lion on the front. And that way I have the perfect Gryffindor jumper. And I think for yarn, uh, it's one of the reasons why I'm still in the planning stage is that I don't have yarn in my stash that will match this project because I want to use something a little bit tweedy, a little bit heathery uh, when I knit this and definitely not unspun. I want to use a spun, spun wool for this. And so I'm going to, I have plans to use up a little bit more of my stash and that's when I'll jump into this project. When my stash is looking nice and empty and I can buy some new wool, I will start work on my Gryffindor wardrobe by starting on this jumper. So jumper taken care of. Now we need, we have a pair of socks, we have a jumper, and we need a scarf. And actually, this book has a pretty good idea for a scarf. It's just I'm not a very big scarf wearer. I'm not sure about this one. Maybe it'll be a cowl, maybe a long cowl that can be draped around twice. I'm looking everywhere for this scarf now. Where is it? Oh, here we go. Hogwarts House scarves. So there's a picture here of a bunch of them. They're very straight, uh, straightforward scarves, long scarves that are knit in stripes. So they'll match my socks pretty well with a fringe on both ends. And there's some pictures of the models wearing them. So they're nice long scarves that you can really wrap around yourself over and over. And I don't really actually have very many of those. I think I have one uh, very chunky brown one that I knit years ago that I still wear when it gets properly cold. So actually, that's not a bad idea either. So that's the scarf taken care of. Now, in terms of my mittens, again, sticking to this book, there is a lovely, lovely pair of mittens which are called Luna Lovegood Spectre Specs Gloves. Now they're gloves, but I could very easily forego, um, forego the fingers there and just turn them into mittens. But these are absolutely delightful and they bring together my favorite character from the entire story. Uh, of Harry Potter, which is Luna Lovegood. She's the, she's the, she is the Ravenclaw who would have been also my best friend if I had gone to her. <laughs> she's absolutely lovely. And um, here's a better picture of them. And these are these back to front, um, you know, knitted in opposite colors gloves, and they're called the Spectre Specs gloves. Um, you know, in honor of the Spectre Specs that Luna Lovegood wears in the movies and in the books, of course. So uh, I'm thinking this would be this would be a fine contender for my Gryffindor mittens or gloves as well, if I don't decide to simply keep them as stripes and just make a matching pair with my socks. However, since I'm probably going to end up with stripes in my uh, scarf. I don't see why I should repeat that in my glove. So maybe I will do Luna Lovegood's Spectre Specs Gryffindor colors, uh, using Gryffindor colors as gloves or mittens. So that is my Gryffindor house wardrobe planned. And you know, I think it might not be too far out of my reach to get it done 
by the end of the year this year because I think I'm going to bump it up on my priority list for my knitting because at the very least I can get the accessories like the gloves or the mittens and the scarf knitted during the warmer weather which is what I usually do is I don't knit with warm weather yarns <laughs> Is that what they say? I don't knit with things like cotton or whatever you would consider warmer weather yarn. I would far rather continue to use wool and just knit the smaller things that I need. And this year I have to focus on my accessory knitting quite a lot because my children are growing up and we have a, a dearth of hats. I noticed this winter I need to knit a lot more hats uh, to keep growing heads warmer. Um, a few more socks for the little, the two littlest ones who are who will be much bigger by this winter. So hats, booties, socks, scarves, things like that. We need a few more. So I'm going to be busy in the summer knitting those things anyway out of wool. And perhaps I can add my uh, Harry Potter wardrobe accessories to that list. But you have no idea. I'm actually restraining myself a lot. <laughs> trying to hold back my excitement at ending up with a Gryffindor house wardrobe. I'm very excited and I hope you'll stick with me through this journey and we can all come out on the other end and I hope that towards Christmas I can have a full episode dedicated fully to my Gryffindor house wardrobe and I can show and tell and we can have a bit of a Gryffindor themed episode. Ah, if all goes well. That's the plan. That's the plan. <laughs> oh my goodness. I am a kid in many ways. Just a kid in, instead of a candy store, uh, a wool store. Yeah, that's what I am. So we have spoken about the Gryffindor wardrobe and I'm, again, make sure that I have time for... Yes, I think I do have a little bit of time to speak about not my show and tell. I don't think I'm going to have a chance to talk about my show and tell. Once again, I'm going to have to postpone my hand spun show and tell to the following episode. Ah, oh, we simply, I, I simply seem to have so much to say in these episodes that, you know, um, I run out of time and I <clears throat> really don't want to make my episodes too long. I'd rather keep coming back on a more regular basis. And I do have something to say about that at the very end. So instead of doing my show and tell for my hand spun, I think I will save that for the following episode, for the next episode, and make that episode entirely about spinning and my hand spun stash. And I will also need to spend quite a bit of time on my hand spun because I'm going to need your help in deciding what patterns I can use for what uh, of what patterns I can use for each of my hand spun skeins. So in order to do that I need to figure out the weights of each thing that I have spun. I need to figure out how much I have of each thing. So once I have all that information together that will be a good time to get in front of the camera and do an episode that is entirely about my hand spun and where you can help me because this is something that I really um, want to dedicate myself to more this year is to using up my hand spun, to knit it up um, and not let it just pile up. And I'm going to need your help with that because I find it really difficult to decide what to turn my hand spun into and difficult to know what will, you know, which patterns will cover um, the amounts that I have. So I think asking for your help in this area is going to be very, very, very good for me. <laughs> Let me take a little sip of my tea. <clears throat> I do feel like my throat is a little bit, a little bit more scratchy because of all the seasonal changes, not just not really the pollen, I'm not very sensitive to pollen, but I am sensitive to temperature shifts of it being very warm and then suddenly very cold again. So here we will skip that segment of the podcast and move on to the next one, which is to talk about my recent spins. So I have been getting so much joy, so much joy ever since I returned to my spinning wheel on 31st night, New Year's Eve, 2019. 
2023. And um, I can't express to you, it's very difficult to find the words to talk about my spinning because Spinning is something I have done for far less time than knitting. And yet I think out of everything I do with my hands, apart from indigo, apart from my work with the vat, which is, which is on a level of art, that is sort of the art that I have dis- devoted my life to. And it's also more on a spiritual level. It almost transcends, transcends art and is part of my sadhana and my approach to to life in general. So it's it's difficult to talk about my indigo work in in you know in uh, and connect it to anything else I do in my life. It kind of lives in a sphere of its own. However, spinning comes very close. Comes very close. And it is strange because it is the thing I have never done in my life before uh 2000 and when was it? 2018, I believe, oh, 2019, is when my husband, who at the time, uh, uh, we were separated actually, sent me as a gift this spinning wheel. We were still, uh, he was still living in the Netherlands and we were going back and forth. And this was a gift to me from my husband and I had never spun before. I had never seen a spinning wheel till this darling came into my life. And um, since then, it has, from the first time I spun on it, it has been like a calling to something I had always done. And I, I will speak more of this in the next episode, which I want to de- dedicate solely to spinning and the story of how I started spinning and the story of this beautiful wheel which is sitting behind me. So uh, recent spins is this is something I completed uh, since the last episode. This was what was on the bobbin when I last spoke to you actually and this is the remainder of the sock yarn. So this is um, this is the wool that I used to knit both a pair of socks for my husband and for myself. And I showed those socks in the last episode and the remaining uh, remaining fiber, uh, sorry, the remaining singles that I had, I spun up into this tiny little skein. And I'm not entirely sure what this is going to be used for, but this is going into the stash and I will get your advice on this in the next episode. And it was lovely to finish it and to wash it and it's just, it's beautiful. This is from, uh, this is using fiber from Hone Ok Air, who are the same wool makers who make Nutiden. The fiber was purchased from them a long time ago, many years ago. Uh, I think around the time that I actually, not shortly after I got my wheel actually. And it is a once carded, I mean, and I remember at the time uh, they told me that it was like barely carded. Uh, wool from an old Swedish breed, the name of who I have, the name of the breed I've forgotten, but um, it is an old Swedish breed and it has uh, those lovely long, dark, strong guard hairs all the way through this wool, uh, which is testament to the fact that it is an old breed. So uh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful wool. You can see those beautiful golden flecks going all the way through the skein as well. So that I finished. And since then, I have been working on some Jacob's fiber. And I believe I showed some of this to you in the last episode as well. So this is Jacob's from Jan Gillanders, our Auntie Jan, who lives very close to us. Um, She is the the most incredible wool woman. And she has a flock of uh, Jacob's sheep, who are a very special breed of sheep. Um, and they are one of these ancient breeds, uh, horned breeds of sheep. And uh, this is from one of her sheep, uh, Helen, from the U crew, <laughs> Auntie Jan's U crew. And this is some fiber that I had got from Helen. Um, I think it was a couple of years ago and I had sat in my studio and I wanted uh, to turn it into something. And I've been spinning, spinning, spinning happily away on it. And I had some previous, so the way I spun this, it's it's a bit of a story actually. And I really hope I have enough time for this story. I think I do. 
So I had a couple of bobbins. I have three bobbins in total. I only have the three bobbins that I that came with my spinning wheel. And I had started spinning this fiber a while back. And um, I had one bobbin, which was really just a play spin. And I think I spun this when I was pregnant with my then toddler, or was she already born? Oh, so much has happened in the last couple of years, back-to-back -back pregnancies. <laughs> I've completely lost track of when, what happened, you know? Um, so sometime, um, I was pregnant when I was spinning this, that much I know. And I was simply playing with the fiber. I, I just wanted to get to know Helen's wool. And I wasn't paying that much attention to what I was spinning. So at some times I was spinning very, very, very fine, finer than lace weight almost. And then other times I was spinning a slightly thicker singles. And so the whole bobbin was kind of going like that. And then I had stopped for whatever reason, midway in that bobbin, and started on a different bobbin with a slightly thicker, uh, um, again, slightly thicker uh, singles. So it was sort of all over the place, these two bobbins. So I didn't want to ply them together. I know in the last episode I said I wanted to ply the thicker uh, singles with the thinner and see what I got. But instead, I sat there one night while I was still, I was feeling that something was not right with my body, but I hadn't tanked yet. Um, and I came out that night to sit with my spinning wheel, as I've been doing often this year, uh, a communing, a sort of rooting, a, a part, really a part of sadhana. And I sat at the spinning wheel and I was looking at this bobbin. Um, this particular wheel has those two spikes that come out. <laughs> I think they're called lazy somethings, lazy Janes, <laughs> lazy daisy. I don't know. I, I told you my relationship to spinning is entirely um, physical and emotional and spiritual and but anything but the intellect. It is not intellectual. So I have avoided learning. I have avoided a learned approach to spinning from the very beginning, um, simply because it is my nature when it comes to art in general to avoid the learned approach and to bring a very instinctive, very sort of from within sort of connection and approach. Uh, to fiber and textiles especially, but to spinning, that that necessity of protecting that space has felt even more urgent for some reason, and I don't know why. Uh, but anyway, I don't have a learned approach to spinning. So whatever those things are <laughs> that stick out of the spinning wheel, <laughs> um, that, from which you can ply the wool, right? You put one bobbin on one side and the other bobbin on the other side and you ply them together. So I had this these two bobbins sitting there and I was thinking, ah, oh, so much, you know, the, the weight of the yarn is varying within the bobbin, varying between the bobbins. So what to do, what to do, what to do. Then I realized that what I really wanted to do is to simply use a, that one bobbin to ply out of a single bobbin and to somehow end up with two plies or whatever. So I messed around and this is what I do. Most of my work with fiber in the initial stages especially, is a lot of mess around and find out. <laughs> you know, a lot of play around and find out what happens. And with this, this was definitely the case. I took one of the strands out of the bobbin, I threaded it through, you know, uh, put a leader on my bobbin in the, in the spinning wheel. And I was just messing around, trying to figure out, making loops around my hand, making all kinds of nonsense, trying to get my body to tell me in communion with the wool how I was going to solve this problem. How was I going to get two strands out of this one strand? And then suddenly I started doing something. It got all tangled up. I had to get everything out of the, uh, out of the wheel again, start again. And this went on for a while, I would say a good hour, but I didn't give up. I didn't give up. I treated it as a sadhana. And suddenly I noticed I got a certain hand motion just right 
to where I had created a loop. I knew a loop was going to be very important because loops are part of everything I do, whether it's crochet or the sewing machine. Whenever you're trying to lock two pieces of fiber together, a loop is involved. Even in knitting, the loop is involved, even though the loop is a little bit more open in knitting. Um, and I was thinking in terms of a crochet hook, of a sewing machine, shuttle, needle, you know, all these things were happening. You can't quite describe it afterwards, but there's a lot going on. And suddenly it clicked into place. And here I was plying wool out of a single strand of yarn, a single strand of wool coming out of this, of a single bobbin. And so I kept going, kept going and kept paying a lot of attention to what my hands were doing. And in the end, you know, I filled up half the bobbin that night and I went back and it took me a couple of days to come back to it. But in those, in that time, I found out by going online that what I was doing was essentially <laughs> a form of something called chain plying. Now I had heard the term chain plying in probably a podcast or something like that, um, but I had never actually looked into it. And I found out that there are many different variations of chain plying uh, that people do in all kinds of different ways. Some people use their hands, some people use center wound, uh, center pull ball, some people use, um, I don't know, there seem to be many ways to chain ply. So, and some people use the bobbin itself and this looped technique to create plying out of a single, out of a single strand of a single. So what I was doing, I really hope I'm not confusing you. I was, I had done a form of chain plying um, not invented it because of course you don't invent anything. There's nothing new under the sun <laughs> when it comes to something like fiber arts because it has this, these, these crafts are such integral parts of human evolution and have been done by human hands for such a long time, thousands of years, that there cannot possibly be anything new. We are just constantly tapping. We are tapping into that enormous taproot of ancestral knowledge and memory and just we're doing the same things we're repeating the same motions and finding the same joy in the process so I was ending up with not just two strands but three strands so I was making my first ever three ply I never made a three ply before uh, of uh, this lovely Jacob. So I have here a full bobbin of three ply and because of the varying weights of the singles that were used from within the same bobbin, um, the, the look of the wool is actually, um, I think this is the closest thing I've ever made to something like an art yarn. Um, I tend to spin quite fine and quite regularly. It's something I've always done since my very first spin. And I've never really ventured into the territory of art yarn, but I think this is kind of like a very tame art yarn, I would say, so I'm excited about it. I'm excited to have my first art-ish yarn. And um, so both bobbins, both the odd bobbins were chain plied now <laughs> into this single one. And I was, I was ecstatic. I was so happy. I was over the moon. I was given yet another uh, vindication as to why I love spinning so much. It's, it's that knowledge that I am, I'm tapping into something so much larger than myself, but also within myself. So old, so not even my own memories, but so much feeling like it is close to me. Ugh, how to explain these things? I sound like an absolute lunatic when I try, so I'm going to leave off. But since I finished that, I took the last of the same fiber from Helen, from Auntie Jan's lovely Helen, uh, same uh, bit of Jacob's, and I've finished spinning that into a very, very, very fine single, which Again, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. It's a very tiny amount. It might just become a very sweet little sample that I might send through my indigo vat. I'll just unravel it so you can see how fine it is. Ooh, it's actually coming off quite a bit. So there, there. A very fine single. And um, that's it. Those have been my recent spins. So... <laughs> Once again, um, I do have to run away from you all, but before I do, 
uh, I have to run away from you all for two reasons, by the way, not just to go and nurse my sweet baby, who will be getting impatient without me, but because my lovely, lovely Arik, my husband, has brought me, bought me rather, a special treat. Because I have been so unwell and because I've been working very hard, he feels. I always feel like I could be working harder, but he feels I work, he feels that I work way too hard. Um, he has brought, bought me tickets to go and watch the new Dune movie, Dune number two, um, at our local uh, theater in our small town, which is a bit of a drive away, but uh, within reach of me. And he has bought me a ticket to go to the cinema. And it is going to be my first time going to the movies to watch a movie since... It's been 10 years. It's been over 10 years, actually, because the last time I went to the movies to watch a movie, went to the cinema, uh, theater house, was three days before my first baby was born in central Seoul in South Korea. My firstborn was born in Korea. And three days before she was born, I went into a, a cinema to watch, I think, the last of the Hunger Games movies or one of those. I can't remember. It was a Hunger Games movie. And uh, and I have not since then stepped into a cinema simply because of the way life has been for me with baby after baby and so much, just so much life happening. And uh, I'm so excited. I can't contain it. And at the same time, I'm trying to contain it because I feel almost nervous to be going and uh, doing something that I have always loved ever since even my university days. I used to love going to the cinema on my own. It was something I always did as a treat for myself. Uh, I would go and get a little popcorn, get a little drink and sit down and watch a movie on my own. It's it's probably something I love more than anything else to do, uh, more than going to a restaurant, more than going, sh definitely more than shopping. I'm not much of a shopper at all. Um, so I'm very excited to go out there and watch Dune too. Dune is also a very important story, has been in my life. I discovered it when I was a teenager and I read through all the Dune books. And then years later, I find myself living in a part of the world which I think, I think we, I'm about two and a half hours away from where Frank Herbert, the author, the incredible author of Dune, lived and worked and wrote all these amazing, prophetic, profound works of literature. I think Dune, the Dune series is one of the most underrated works of literature out there. Um, you could be, Possibly because for me, you can't rate it highly enough, these works of science fiction. I've always been a science fiction fan as well. So anyway, I have to get to the movie on time as well, so I can't be here for too long. But I will take a few minutes to let you know what's been bothering me with my health. And let me take a quick sip first. So I wrote about it on Instagram recently. Um, telling everyone why the podcast was taking a little bit of time to come out. And it's very simple. I have had trouble with anemia for a long time. And I have been sort of floating between iron deficiency and anemia for a very, you know, ever since my first pregnancy. But really in the last two pregnancies, they have become a lot worse. And my last pregnancy, it, um, it went all the way down to me being fully anemic about two months before I was due to give birth and I, uh, nothing was working, and I had to, you know, my, my doctor and my midwife were so concerned that they insisted that I get an intravenous iron infusion because my levels were so low. And while that brought it up enough for me to have a safe and happy home birth, um, I have birthed all my babies at home, and it was safe and beautiful, and I had a good postpartum time, you know, in the last year or so, I, I felt that it was starting to go low again. And, you know, just life, things have been so busy for us that I wasn't able to tackle it. And I just kept putting it on the back burner, putting it on the back burner, putting it away. As mothers do, we put ourselves as far away from the front of the line as we can. <laughs> and with four children to care for, you know, the front of the line is quite far away. So recently I couldn't ignore it anymore and it completely collapsed to rock bottom. I had to go to the doctor. I couldn't find excuses anymore. And I found out that my levels had literally hit the basement and I was having all kinds of other very dangerous symptoms um, that uh, made it uh, quite concerning for everyone who knew about it, including uh, my doctor 
and of course my family and my husband. So I have been trying to take it easy and I have a deadline to meet by my doctor <laughs> to bring my levels up to a certain le uh, certain point where he feels that it's safe enough for me not to have another iron transfusion, an intravenous iron transfusion. And I'm trying to achieve that because I really didn't enjoy the transfusion. I, I, f I had some side effects from it the last time I had it, which were not pleasant really very unpleasant and I really would rather not repeat it. So I'm trying very hard with changes in diet, changes in sleep, rest, uh, taking iron supplements, whatever it is, I'm doing everything in my power to get these levels up by myself and not have to undergo another infusion, uh, transfusion therapy rather. So that's why I, uh, where I have been, that's what I'm going through at the moment. Um, my energy is feeling better now, but it's very unpredictable. So I could be feeling really good like I am right now and then tank completely and be done for for the next four or five days. Um, and because I have a tendency to sort of not be able to gauge very well my pain levels, I have, if anything, a too high pain threshold uh, where I have to, you know, where my body shuts down well before my mind accepts it. <laughs> So, yeah, it's a problem. I know, I know, I know. I need to work on that. I really do. So uh, because of that, um, it's very up and down. So that's where I've been, but I am taking care of myself. And in terms of my mental space and my emotional space, I'm doing very well. Uh, don't be worried. I'm not low. I am as chipper as I can be when you're feeling like that. <laughs> You, know, you can't quite see it in me, but inside I'm fine. I just know that I have to take a very different approach to my whole self and my health. And I have to really force myself to the front of the line for a while. Um, I really need to do that. So that is what I am doing at the moment. Putting myself first, tending to my health and treating myself as the temple that I am. Um, and yeah, so... You know, I'm hoping I'm, and I know, I know I will recover. I will recover soon. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining in today. I am, I just look forward to these moments so much. I really enjoy sitting and talking to you. And, you know, anemia or no anemia, I'm, I really just, I, I don't like uh, postponing not for any other reason than the fact that I get so much joy sitting here and talking about my wool and my knitting with you. It just gives me so much joy. So thank you so much for being here, for finding the podcast. If you enjoyed it, please remember to give me a thumbs up. Uh, to hit that like button. And if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe to the channel so that you know when the next video comes out, which will be very soon, very, very soon indeed. I am putting now all of my effort and my focus on my YouTube channel and my blog going forwards. I have, I'm doing a very swift and decisive retraction from Instagram, which has gobbled up, I believe, far too much of my creative energy, my time and my effort um, I am, I've made a decision which I'm going to be announcing through my blog and on my Instagram very soon, probably this week, maybe even before this podcast goes live on YouTube, that I'm done <laughs> in many ways with Instagram. And from now on, Instagram is going to be used by me in a very specific way. And YouTube is where I'm going to spend a lot more of my time on. My blog and my website is where I'm going to spend a lot of my time on. And that means more podcast episodes and more time to sit and chat with you, which I'm so grateful for. I'm, I'm so glad I had this clarity and this decision to change about the way I do my online work. Anyway, anyway, I must go. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you're all taking good care of yourselves. Please do look after yourselves. And as I always end, keep your hands in wool and your heart in kindness and all will be as it should be. Ayubowan, namaskaram. See you next time. <laughs> Bye.